Okay, so I'm going to do 1.2 part A. I was going to do it in one video, but as I started making this uh, PowerPoint for it, I realized how long section five is, so I'm going to do that on its own. So nature of applications. An application is a piece of software that provides some sort of service, normally with the user interface. So something like a printer spooler, which is uh, you know basically feeding the printer one after the other, uh, in the background would not technically be called an application, although you'll probably hear it online, you know, incorrectly done so, but I mean, it's, you know, Anyway, so we're going to look at two types of applications, off the shelf and bespoke, okay? So uh, off the shelf means that it's been created for everyone. So it's like Adobe Photoshop is off the shelf. So it'll have more users and it's generally better because it's made by a big company. So it's been bug tested. It's been used thoroughly. Thousands of people are using it, maybe more. But it may do things that you don't need. So you might be paying for stuff that you didn't need it to do. Okay, it's generally that's cheaper. Um, but it may not fulfill your requirements 100% because it's not been made for you. Um, but it's likely to be updated more often and you know, you'll know you know, be able to find more things about it because it's more used, right? So the other alternative is to get someone to make some software for you. So the bonus of that is it will do exactly what you asked for it. Um, it might not be as tested. Yes, they'll test it. Yes, they'll go through a thorough testing process, but you know, like, will they test it on loads of different machines and loads of different stuff going on? And the developer also may stop helping with it. Like, what if they go on? Like, you, you hire this company to develop this piece of software. They're going to maintain it for a few years. They go under, they, you know, they, they quit, whatever reason, and they may not help you with it, or they may charge you an uh, amount to help you, and they're starting to make the charges very expensive. Um, and that might be a problem, because let's say they make an app for Android, and it's on Android 12, and Android 14 comes out, a few years later, but it's got things that break your app. It doesn't work anymore because your app now has to have a higher level of something or other, or something doesn't work anymore. Well, that might, you know, that's not just not working now. It's not just, sorry, bugging out. It doesn't work. And, you know, it can be difficult to fix that. It's not as easy as to get someone else to look at this software, a massive piece of software, and update it. And they'll charge you a lot for that. Um, and obviously, it's more expensive to have the software done for yourself, right? So that goes about the same. Okay, so when you're um, choosing correct software, and what to do. You've got to look at the cost of the software, how reliable it is, does it have the features you want, how compatible it is, what hardware requirements it is. If it's got a, it's a really powerful software, it might cost you more, and how secure it is. And along with things like, you know, how many users, how many updates it's going to have, all those sorts of things. So when you choose some software, you need to think very carefully. So here's an example of that. An office wants to create a document that everyone can edit and alter at the same time. So here, for example, we could use an online version of Google Docs or something, which allows that. Word would be a better piece of software, but online version of Google Docs allows that more. However, it does require the internet and there is less features than the online one. And you're gonna have difficulties about what if people are changing the same thing. So there's very you know, important things to think about. That's what I'm saying when you choose a piece of software, you've got to think about the situation. And you might get an exam question, but you're just gonna to have to use your common sense and think about those things I've said and think about the situation. Another one might be encryption. You know, It might be how secure is the software and stuff. So utility software, I'm not gonna go through too much of this because um, I'm gonna link the video in the description. I know that's a link there and pointless to you, but that's just to help me put it in the description. Um, and you need to watch that because it goes through these four and they well, I go through them actually quite well. So you watch that first if you haven't, and then when you come back, you'll see the next slide. So these are the ones that I didn't cover so much in that video, but I'm not gonna cover them greatly here because they're quite obvious. The antivirus obviously uh, is a piece of software designed to find and remove virus on your computer. Very important to keep it updated. Um, automatic updates, uh, just update your software automatically without you asking to do anything. Windows has a lot of this built in. And automatic backup will make those backups for you automatically. We looked at backups in that video, and this will do that process for you without you clicking anything. So if your computer's on or the server's on, every night it will back up automatically. Now a firewall, I am gonna go through a little bit in more detail. The firewall, um, basically, when you've got uh, two networks, well, you've got you and a network, you've got data coming in and out. Okay, it should really be going both directions here, but I didn't draw that. So I've got some connections coming here that, I, that are not very good, and the algorithm, the firewall, will run an algorithm. It will look at the data coming in and out, just to be clear, because it will block data going out as well if it thinks it shouldn't be. And it might say, right, it's flagging that up as dodgy data. Maybe it's coming from the same IP address. Maybe it's from a certain country you want to block. Maybe it's a certain type of data you want to block. Um, and it'll block it. So basically a firewall filters incoming and outgoing traffic. Um, it does this based on an algorithm or whatever restrictions your company has put on, um, but you just need to know what a firewall does and that's what it does. So open source software versus closed source. Um, 
basically, let's just uh, get rid of that vid uh, box. So basically, the open source software is where they release the source code. So the person releases it. It's for free use, okay? Um, and, this, you know, basically, it's free. Uh, you can modify the software. You can even sell it. But as long as uh, the software you sell is also open source, right? You can change it, do what you want with it. Big time software is Blender, Linux, um, OBS. I'm recording this uh, video in is open source. Um, closed source, which are often called proprietary software. Obviously, it costs money for a license. Um, there's no access to the source code, no access to it. And there's possible restrictions on how to use the software. Like you might be able to install it on one machine or used by a single person. But you could argue it's likely to be more updated and possibly better because of the fact that they're getting money for it. Whereas open source, obviously, you know, they're not getting money for it. So you're just hoping on good community feedback and stuff. But, you know, like I say, Blender and Linux and OBS are very good pieces of open source software. So let's compare them. This often happens. Now you have to look at this from two sides. That's the user and the creator. So we're looking at the user picking open source over priority. So obviously open source is free, but it's more likely to be buggy and less supported because they're not paying for it or they're doing it as a secondary job. Uh, they can, however, look at the code and alter it. So you can look at the code and alter it, which could be a good thing for the user. Um, proprietary for the user is more likely to be supported and less buggy, but obviously costs more. So if you're using an application, and you're thinking about the choice, that's it. If you made the program, these are the pros and cons. Open source doesn't get them any money, but it can get their name out there as a good program. It gets you out there, your name's out there. People can change your software, though, and you might not like it. Okay, that's another thing. Um, proprietary software, obviously, it protects their software code and makes the money if people buy it. So you got to look at both sides of the argument because when people say compare these two, you have to think of it as a user of the software and a maker of the software. You know. So anyway, on to translators, interpreters, compiler assemblers. So again, watch this video. It's going to be another link in the description um, if you haven't done so because it has all the stuff on what those things are. And now we're going to move on to the extra bit for the A-level. So bytecode, right, in some um, languages don't compile the code all the way to machine code. They compile it to an in-between state called bytecode, which then gets executed, okay, interpreted normally. Um, Java does this. The benefit of it is that if you've got the bytecode, you don't have the source code, so you can't um, edit it. You know, it's, it's, it's locked in some way. The reason Java does it is because Java is a virtual machine. So Java works by every operating system has a Java emulator created for it by Sun or whomever who make Java. And then you basically emulate. You basically imagine this is a Java machine that doesn't exist and you emulate it. Imagine it's like a games console that never existed. Java virtual, Java games console. And then you're emulating programs on it. Now you might think that sounds awful, but the benefit of it was to be good for the web because if your operating system, say so Windows, Mac, or Linux, at a Java virtual machine. And if you wrote a piece of code and compiled it, it would work on all those machines. All that had to be done, all those operating systems, all that had to be done was for an operating system, create a Java virtual machine. Right, so now we're gonna do part six, which is linkers and loaders and the use of libraries. So what is a library, okay? So a programming language will have a set of libraries built in, like math, for example, like random, for example, which gives you access to things like about math and making random numbers. But you can write your own libraries for common things you do, or just generally. I have many of them for my games, and I use libraries all the time. By using libraries, you can create a bespoke set of tools for your needs and your company applications. And you can also optimize them really you know, well, and it saves you from rewriting the code. And as well, as you can see on there, it's also a form of decomposition because you're breaking down tasks by default. So let me show you an example of a terrible library I've made deliberately for this video. So here is two uh, Visual Studios, right? So. Here we go. On the left, I've got the app, actual application. This is the application that's using the library, okay, here. And it's writing, in fact, I will do this better. I'll do int d equals double six. And then I will do console right line d. Okay, so there we go. So here is my actual library. I've called it useless stuff because it's just a library for this video. So this is the actual uh, what I import. This makes something called a DLL, which is a dynamic link library, but we'll go more about that later. But this is the understanding of what a library is, not how to make one. So this is um, called use of stuff. So you can see here that I'm using it. So it, is, it essentially allows me to have access to all the stuff up here. I've got a public static class called useless math. And if you know what static class means is that basically this can't be instantiated. I can't make a new useless math M and M1 and M2. 
This exists as its own class. There's one of it, and it's called useless math. So it's got two methods in it. One that returns an integer, taking an integer in and returning double it, and one that actually prints a message to the screen called message. So you can see here that I am getting an int d, accessing useless math dot double, and then I'm writing out the answer, and then I write out the message. So obviously it should print out 12 hello, which it will, let's bring it in from over here. So there you go, 12 hello. So you can see that basically I could write anything in here. And then as long as it's in here, uh, sorry, I'll leave that. I mean, as long as it's in here and I write useless math before it, I can use it, you know, without, without any, you know, from a library. Now, here are some really sort of useful things you could do rather than having a useless one. So let's say, for example, as you've done some coding in C Sharp probably by now, you may have noticed that getting a string input and turning it into an integer is a bit more interesting in C Sharp because also you've probably been writing code before that you've not been worried about what happens if they don't type a number in, what happens if they don't you know, type a letter into a number. But you can't really have that in a real program. You need it to deal with the errors and catch those errors and, and do something. Okay, So you could write a method to get in a, an integer Maybe you can make the method loop until they get it. They type in a valid int integer. And you could call that int read or something like that. So you've got read for string, int read for your one. And then basically you've written your own integer reading thing. It's not that difficult. I could write one now that doesn't do anything interesting. I could do a static uh, public, static, um, which would read an integer. Called, I'll do, I call it in input like this. It takes a string called text, and then I do this. So I do console.write. We'll do it as write because you normally don't want to go onto a new line, and obviously you could just put slash n in the um, text if you wanted a new line. So we're going to console.write out the text, okay? We'll, we'll add a space, we'll add a, a colon. Actually, no, we'll assume they want to put the colon in their text because otherwise I'm limiting it. Right, so then I'm going to get an, an input. So I go string temp equals console.read. There we go. And now I've got to convert it into an integer. There are many ways of doing this. I'm not saying this is the perfect way. I'm going to do a really quick way. So anyway, right, let's have a look. So then we're going to go, let me think. So we're going to go, in fact, I'm even going to, actually, you know what? I'll do it slightly proper. proper. I'll catch the error so it doesn't crash. We go try int r equals int32 dot try pass. Uh, I'll do pass even. Should have been pass. Not try pass, I mean a try block. And then inside there we want temp. Right? Okay. Then, why does it give me an error? Maybe because I haven't got the catch. Catch. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I think it's got a format ex exception. Yep, yeah, there is format exception. Go on, and then I'm going to do nothing. Right, now you might think, what's the point of catching it then? Well, it'll stop the computer crashing, is what it'll do. So then I'm going to return R. Now, I'm actually going to have to do this outside of the, the block in R equals zero. Now, this is the point. Um, if, it, if, it's, if it's incorrect, it's going to return zero which is not necessarily perfect, but at least it won't crash. I'm not saying this is what you should do, but I'm just saying that at least it won't crash now if, if you did it. So now I can get rid of this. I can go int d equals useless stuff dot, oh no, not useless stuff, just useless math, because useless stuff is a name of the uh, namespace. Useless math dot, now I haven't built this, so that isn't gonna work. Rebuild. Just going to hope that it updates that uh, end to null. Then I'm going to try and run it and hope that it will uh, update when it does that build. Right, there we go. Hurrah. So now if I put GH, it just doesn't crash. No crash there. Okay. La 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 la. Fantastic. Uh, whereas if obviously uh, I, didn't, I didn't print out the answer there. Um, actually, what I could have done here is I could have done. A while loop. Maybe I could do that. Try to do a while loop till they enter one in. Yeah, I could do while 
I'll do my obvious bad coding of true. I'll do true with a capital with lowercase t like it's supposed to be. In R, try, tap this in. I'll do, actually I'll do it properly. Um, bool done equals false. While done is equal to false. I'll do this. And then if we catch it, what we'll, what we'll do is we'll set done to true. This is a common thing. If we catch an error, we'll set done to false. Okay, so we're setting it true, trying it, and then we're looping it. So we're gonna keep, let's put that in there. We're gonna keep looping. But we need to put R outside of the loop, or it won't be able to return. Right, so we're gonna keep looping until they enter a proper number. And that, that's just, maybe that's what you want your code to do. I know it's a bit long-winded this, but you could always skip it to the next bit if you really want. Um, and you can see what I'm doing here. So now if I enter H, 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 56, there you go. I'm not doing anything with int D, so I mean, I'm not writing it. So I should, you know, if, I, if you wanted it to be written out, and obviously I could do that, not really gonna be very more exciting. But you can see now I've written a, a, a library. That's, that's a useful thing. Look, you know, enter num 45. Okay, so now I've got that forever. Yeah, okay, and it's just going to sit there looping until they um, enter a number. I could have a thing here that says enter an incorrect invalid number or something, whatever. But you can see now that I've fixed the crashing. That won't crash. Um, and it will never return anything until they do an integer. You know, that could be what you want. Right, anyway, so I'm um, waffling on a lot about um, libraries. Let's go on. So you've got a link up. Right, now you've seen the use of libraries. Okay, so they're all different libraries so you can create these things that are outside of the program and bring them in. Uh, that's what a linker's job is. So it will, it will look through and bring in all of the code and all the stuff it needs from outside sources into one object. So it'll take the main program and it will link all the others together. That's all a linker does. It's not very exciting, but there you go. The last but not least is a loader. Now, when you, what happens is the programs are written to assume they're sort of gonna be a memory address zero, right? Because they don't know where they're gonna be in memory. So all these like addresses that are linking to variables and other things, they're just assuming there is a zero, one, two, three, so on. So what happens is the loader's job is to place the machine code object and any functions and anything like that into memory, and then it will adjust all the memory addresses to the appropriate addresses they are, shift them to where they are. That's the loader's job. It loads the program into memory along with any functions, and it will alter all the memory addresses to be at the correct addresses, because you wouldn't know that when you're writing the program or compiling the program where the memory address is going to be. Okay, that's the unit. I hope it wasn't too long and I'll do part two in a bit.